Today is the 50th anniversary of the tragedy at Kent State. A uh, very sad day in Ohio history. I would like to start our press conference today uh, with a moment of silence, if we could, uh, for those who died, uh, those who were injured, and those whose life was forever changed on that very tragic day. Thank you. I ordered that the flags at the State House uh, and all state buildings um, go to half mast at 1224 today. Uh, they will remain at half mast for the rest of the day. We talked uh, last week about the different working groups that we have put together. Um, that are f focusing on how we restart everyone who's working on those groups. Um, there's a lot of them. I know they're working hard. I, I, I talked to the folks uh, who are working on the restaurant uh, group today, and I know they made some very good, good progress today. Looks like they're about done uh, about the, the protocol and so we're very happy about that. So in the, in, within the next several days, we'll be uh, rolling out that protocol. And at the same time, we will be able to announce the date uh, when restaurants can start back in. So I know people are anxious about that. And we will be doing that in the next, in the next several days. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I think is important to note is that each one of these groups is comprised of people in that industry. Uh, with the restaurant group, we have people who are involved in small diners uh, all the way up to big, bigger chains of restaurants. Um, and they have worked very, very hard. And I'm grateful for that work. And you'll have the opportunity to see the results of that in the next, in the next, next several days. So as, as we start back, um, really with today, uh, with the opening of uh, the manufacturing, the distribution, the construction uh, offices uh, that were not already open, um, and then as we look to next week, when on May 12th, all retail will be completely open, uh, I would remind uh, everyone because um, uh, Senate President uh, Larry Alphoff reminded me a couple of minutes ago that uh, uh, some people maybe not did not hear uh, or not did not get the information in regard to the ability of retail right now uh, to take appointments uh, or to do curbside side service. Now we know that not every retail facility uh, can take advantage of that. But we also know that some of them are, and I've noticed actually news, newspaper advertisements and advertisements online uh, talking about uh, those, those appointments for some companies. So we would remind everybody uh, that is available today if that works for your retail company. Uh, but everybody will be open uh, on, on, on May 12th. And the other working groups are working very, very hard um, to come up with the best protocol. And so as we start this new phase, um, you know, the emphasis uh, is on how and making sure that as we go back, uh, we do it in as safe a way as possible. And for that, we are relying uh, really on the people who do the work every single day, who know how to run a restaurant, for example, or, or know how how uh, their barbershop works. Um, we're relying on them to really kind of set the guidelines and the standards uh, so that we can assure people when they go back that they are as safe as they, as they can be. As we start back at this point, uh, I think it's important to pause for a moment 
and I would ask Eric if you could put the chart up. Uh, Dr. Acton will talk about these. This is a chart she uses every day, uh, but this is the chart for today, and she'll make reference to it today. Uh, but we've asked the folks who do the chart and do the d data to give us a 21-day trend, because a 21-day trend, I think, gives you a, a fairly good idea how we doing. Are we doing better? Are we doing worse? Are we doing the same? And I always look at, there's a lot of things to look at, but I always look at hospitalizations because hospitalization is, is a real figure. Uh, these are people who, when they go in, they go in because they know that they have the COVID-19. Um, and so that hospitalization figure uh, is right here. And again, it's only 21 days, but we were showing you five-day periods. Now we're showing you a, we're comparing what today's numbers were. So if you go over, for example, um, if you look at under hospitalizations, it gives you the total reported. Doesn't mean they're still all in the hospital. Certainly, we have got another graph that shows how many are there. But then you go to last reported 24-hour hospitalization change. Snapshot, last 24 hours, so 40 additional people were hospitalized. Uh, if you look at the 21-day rolling average, the average of that last 21 days, it is average of 85 per day. So obviously, uh, you know, this, these are good numbers. But the better view is if you look at the trend line. And so the trend line, maybe not as good as we would want, certainly, but it is what it is. It's, it, is, it, is it is going down. You can see a trend line on deaths. Uh, this was due, I think Dr. Acton would tell you, to just a spike and a dump, frankly, of, of the numbers of people who had died in a number of days previously to that. Uh, but that, you can kind of see where those numbers are. The cases, you kind of see where, again, where those numbers are. So not exactly where we would want it, certainly, uh, but it gives you an idea that we, we are headed in the direction. So as we start to open, really, do more things in Ohio today. We're going to keep an eye on these numbers. And you probably won't, you know, you're not going to see a change in these because all these things take a while. Uh, but, you know, in three weeks, four weeks, as we look at these, we'll want to compare where we are uh, with where we were on this, on this date. This is, a, this is an important date as we really start to open, open back up. And again, uh, at this point, um, it's always been about what you do, uh, not so much about what I say or Dr. Acton or, or the lieutenant governor says. It's really what you do. You're the ones who have got us here. We have not. You took us here. And so as you get, there's more and more things are opened up and more and more opportunities to go out and do things, and we want people to, to do that. Uh, but this, on the same, the same time, we just want everybody to continue to be cautious continue to follow basic distancing protocol and go out, uh, enjoy these retail uh, businesses in a week. Uh, restaurants will be coming on not too long after that. Uh, so a lot of things are happening as we are opening up in Ohio. But again, really, this is, this is now really, really up, up to you. And uh, we just need to keep monitoring the numbers and, and see where we are going and what we will try to do or what we will do is something that we've done throughout, and that is to be as open with you and share with you every day uh, where, where these numbers, numbers are. So that gives us a little uh, snapshot in, in time. I don't usually uh, comment about demonstrators. And the reason I don't comment about demonstrators is because uh, I've been in public office for 40 years. Um, I have a great respect for their constitutional right to demonstrate. Um, I've had demonstrators demonstrate against me uh, in most of the offices, if not all the offices that I've ever held. Uh, they've done it in many places, in many locations. They've done it uh, for many, many different, different times. Um, as I shared with all of you, Fran and I grew up in Yellow Springs. We grew up in a town that valued and values the First Amendment uh, to a great extent. And as we were growing up, demonstrators were in Yellow Springs a lot. And, and so 
that is uh, something we're used to and something that we respect and we respect. Um, and so I am fair game. But I want to talk for a moment about what's not fair game. It's not fair game to disrespect the news media, to be obnoxious to the news media. That's not fair game. You should come after me. Don't go after people who are exercising the First Amendment rights, a First Amendment rights that we value in this country so very, very much. Uh, reporters, photographers, who are doing nothing more than following that First Amendment, informing the public, and just remember, they're informing the Republic, the public, they're informing the public about what you think, what you're saying, and what you think is important. And best way for you to get that across is the news media is going to cover you. Um, but to treat them with disrespect, uh, to not observe social distancing with them, uh, to be just obnoxious, um, I, just, I just find that very, very sad. So come after me. I'm fair game. They're not. Let me say what else is not fair game. I'm the elected official. I'm the one who ran for office. Uh, I'm the one who makes the policy decisions. The members of my cabinet, Dr. Acton included, work exceedingly, exceedingly hard. But I set the policy. So when you don't like the policy, again, you can demonstrate against me. Uh, that, is, that is certainly fair game. Uh, but to bother the family of Dr. Acton, uh, I don't think that's fair game. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's necessary to get your point across. You can get your point across very, very easily any day of the week uh, with demonstrations against what I am doing or what policies that you disagree with. As I said the other day, uh, one of my favorite presidents uh, had on his desk the sign, the buck stops here, Harry Truman. Buck stops with me. I'm the responsible person. I want to bring everybody up to date on uh, what we're doing with, with testing. Uh, and this is something that we've had some, uh, as I shared with you last week, some very, very, very good news. Uh, a contract with Thermal Fisher. Uh, Ohio manufacturers who have really stepped up to make the swabs. Uh, we now have a very, very aggressive testing program. We're able to test. Uh, we'll, we'll be in about a week up to 22,000 per day. Um, this, this is in the process of being spread out throughout the state of Ohio, no matter what region you, you live in. So. We're very, very happy about that. Um, this expanded testing is key, really, to protecting Ohioans, and it's particularly key as we go through this o reopening phase of our economy. Uh, it will give us a better ability to learn who's sick and determine how best to respond. With more tests, we will continue to emphasize the testing of patients who are most severely ill, patients who are moderately ill with underlying medical conditions, and individuals, individuals um, who are critical to keeping us safe. Uh, and these would be our first responders. This would be our people in the medical community. It's important to remember that testing is only one, of course, response to the virus. Uh, it allows us to quickly identify individuals infected with COVID-19, promptly isolate them, um, and determine who they've been in close contact with, and that is a central part of what we are doing. As I indicated also last week, we're uh, standing up a group that we hope will reach about 1,800 
uh, people around the state of Ohio who will do this process as far um, as identifying uh, and, and tracing uh, who may have been in contact with the person who's been infected. Increased testing capacity uh, does not replace infection control and prevention. Uh, so I will emphasize uh, what we all know matters. Uh, keeping your distance, washing your hands, sanitizing surfaces where possible, and wearing a mask. What increased testing will do is help us identify those who are sick and who live and work in areas where the virus may rapidly spread so we can better protect our loved ones and those who are protecting them. Those areas include nursing homes and other congregate living settings such as developmental centers, treatment facilities, homeless and domestic violence shelters, youth detention centers, and other areas where community outbreaks occur. So this is a chart, and Dr. Acton will sp uh, spend some time at, and give you a much more intelligent uh, and learned uh, uh, d details about what this means. But this is the ch chart that is now the policy, uh, and this is going to provide a lot more testing around the state of Ohio. Uh, and again, as I said, Dr. Acton will explain it in more detail. Uh, we're significantly increasing testing. Uh, but our capacity remains not unlimited. Uh, it's not unlimited. Uh, today, the Ohio Department of Health is, is issuing new guidance uh, to do just that. Details will be available on the coronavirus website at coronavirus.ohio.gov. Early and rapid identification will help local health departments stop the fret spread of infection and provide treatment for those who need extensive medical care. Uh, this will help isolate COVID-19 within a facility or community by separating otherwise healthy residents and workers from those who are infected. And I, I would again call your attention, if Eric, if you can put that one back up a moment. Um, as, you, as you pull this up, uh, take a look at the definition of congregate living settings. And you'll see the reference that, that is up here because congregate living settings are, are quite extensive. And we have a lot of our fellow Ohioans, our family members, our relatives who are in these facilities. So it is not just nursing homes. Uh, although those, those, we have a, a significant number of the population who lives there. Uh, but it's also, as it says on here, uh, assisted living nursing centers, the Ohio veterans homes, the two of those, residential facilities for mental health substance use treatment, psychiatric hospitals, group homes, centers, facilities, group homes for people with intellectual disabilities, uh, places for the homeless, domestic violence shelters, youth detention centers, prisons, and jails. And so when Dr. Acton gets to this and explains this grouping, uh, just keep in mind that this is a large number of, of individuals in Ohio. And so we're going now, because of this testing capability, we're able to do, be a lot more aggressive uh, in regard to, to this, this testing. Uh, and we're very happy to be able to, to do that. Uh, I'm going to stop at this point and uh, turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, good afternoon. Last week, we had some questions about the BMV and when the BMVs might be opening up again. And I have an update on that. Uh, uh, as as um, many of you know, uh, there has been a, a period, uh, thanks to the legislature's actions on House Bill 197, that allows the extension of deadlines on all expiration dates while the BMVs are closed. So uh, that issue, uh, as far as expiration dates, has been resolved temporarily, thanks to that legislation. There are five BMVs across the state uh, that are open to serve special needs uh, where there is a required in-person visit during this time for essential services that people need. Um, but the opening of the physical sites of all the BMVs around the state will not happen until later in May. Uh, there's no fixed date yet, and I'll explain why that is. Uh, they're currently working on a plan at each individual B BMV 
uh, where the deputy registrars will reactivate the hiring of staff, uh, make accommodations in the facility to ensure social distancing and safety measures, uh, including the physical barriers and such. As you, as you know from an experience in the BMV, there can be uh, a, a, a small waiting area and people would be congregated where we couldn't keep the social distancing in place. And so the reason for the, the, the um, uh, late May opening is that we are uh, in the process of doing something we were already underway with. That is the get in line online uh, service where we are allowing people to check in online and that way we can space people out. Uh, they can make their reservations uh, and we can work through that process to make it efficient for everybody as they begin to re-engage. Uh, we, we had rolled uh, the Get In Line online system out with the Innovate Ohio and the BMV teams working together to do that. Uh, we got through uh, uh, about 20 of them uh, so far, but we're going to get all of them uh, in that situation where, they were, where you will be able to check in online prior to opening them up at the end of the month. So we don't want large crowds. We don't want everybody rushing back. We, will, we are creating an online system to do that so that we have an orderly uh, process for when we restart the BMVs to avoid uh, a, a large rush of people coming at the same time. Uh, and so more information will be coming soon, but wanted to make sure that you knew that. Uh, additionally, a large number of services are already available online uh, in a variety of things like vehicle registration, vehicle repla uh, plate replacement, et cetera. So all of those things are already available through the online portal and services. Please use those if you need them and know that uh, there has, we spent suspended expiration dates until we get the BMVs open back up and we have the online portal in place. As the governor uh, mentioned a little earlier, today is a, a big day for a lot of people who are going back to work. Uh, many uh, businesses in manufacturing, uh, construction, and the entire distribution system, uh, if they weren't already open, uh, they are open. Uh, and, that, uh, and that all of them are safer today because of the, the protocols and the way that we've learned how to operate these businesses more safely for employees and customers. Uh, I, I did want to emphasize something that the governor mentioned on retail. It is open for appointment uh, only services and curbside service as well. Uh, and uh, Mother's Day is coming up, so flowers, jewelry, those kinds of things, you can access those businesses uh, to uh, purchase something nice for mom as we head towards Mother's Day. And uh, those retailers will be happy to serve you and, and uh, do it through the curbside and, and uh, uh, appointment-only system. Uh, but the work groups uh, are planning and working through these issues on restaurants and and personal care, and we, we look forward to delivering those to the governor uh, in the coming day. Uh, another thing that um, I guess I want to emphasize as we do this is that, as been said many times, uh, we can do two things at once. We've learned how to open up aspects of our economy and also make sure people are, are doing so as safe as possible. Uh, we are learning how to live with coronavirus in our lives as it will be with us for a while. That, that graph that the governor uh, mentioned earlier about hospitalizations being on the way down, this is because of you. Uh, but I also want to say that we're in this position, and I want to give credit where credit's due. Dr. Acton sent out the early warning signs. Governor took early action. And Ohio is in a much better shape today than a lot of states are because of those early actions. And when you look at the information about opening back up, Ohio's also, uh, when you compare it to a lot of our surrounding states also, going to be on the early side of this. Uh, it's because of the good work that people of Ohio did and the, and the early actions that we have taken as a state that puts us in a much better place today than we would otherwise be. Uh, and that's something to celebrate. It is. It's a victory. It's a victory for the people of the state of Ohio. Uh, and we learned a lot. We know more today than we did when it started. Uh, we know how to protect. We know who's most vulnerable, and we know how to protect those who are the most vulnerable. But as I, I heard a couple of times over the weekend, um, 
you know, trust us to do the right thing was, com was something that I heard on a number of occasions from a number of conversations that I had. And I want you to know that this policy counts on it. This policy counts on the fact that people of, the people of Ohio will continue to do the right thing. Because in the coming days and weeks, as things begin to open up, the only way that we can keep that hospital trend where it needs to be on the decline, not seeing us rise back up, is for people to just do what's right. Uh, there's no other way. There's no other way for us to be successful. Uh, we are going to have to exercise personal responsibility, which creates the collective responsibility to, to reopen aspects of our economy and to keep all of us safe, particularly those who are most vulnerable. And um, uh, I tell you, you know, I truly appreciate all of the feedback that we get from legislators, from business owners, uh, from just people I have met over the years who are keeping the governor and I very informed about what their views are, are on things. It, it's super helpful. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I want you to know that we are trusting you. We're building a plan that depends on it. And uh, Ohio is in great shape today, uh, thanks to you. Uh, and now uh, we, have, uh, we have an opportunity throughout the month of May uh, to continue uh, to both have success on the health side and on the economic side. Governor? Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Dr. Acton? Yeah, thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Monday. Uh, beautiful day. We'll start uh, with our statistics. Um, today, at this point in Ohio, we have documented 20,474 cases. Um, and this is in 88 counties. Um, and our deaths now have reached um, 1,056. Next. Um, again, we, we are seeing here that we are having hospitalizations make up about 19% of our cases. ICU, um, requiring ICU is about 5%. Healthcare workers make up 16% of our cases. And we do see, we continue to see it skewing more toward male, 56% uh, per of males. Um, next slide. As the governor said, we're extending our graph. I still think it might be hard to see at home, but go to our website, coronavirus.ohio.gov. You'll be finding a lot more data there. One of the governor and lieutenant governor's main initiatives for our state, our whole enterprise, is to set the data free, get you the information. We know a lot of researchers are interested in others, uh, including the media. So um, we'll find more of this that you can see if you can see it better. But it's really important uh, with the data to look over about a three-week period. First of all, it takes about two weeks uh, incubation period from the time you are infected to possibly as long as two weeks to have symptoms. And then it takes another week before you might seek care for those symptoms, either be hospitalized or reach out to your doctor. Um, and we know, of course, that um, other things like being in the ICU or deaths or later. So by looking at three weeks and looking at rolling numbers, any one day uh, might have a glitch for a number of reasons, sometimes even by someone being absent and then reporting all their data over two days. No system is perfect. So when we really stretch it out and look at trends, this gives us a clearer picture. And as you can see, um, we have stayed relatively flat. We're having some ups and downs on most of these indicators, but no significant change. Uh, next slide. Uh, as the governor said, why, why is this important that we have these statewide testing criteria? You know, the answer to that is really that we still have, uh, at this point, we've tested um, a little over 1% of our population, and, and we are increasing our testing capacity greatly. We've made some incredible strides, but it's important to know that when we don't have enough to just anyone can go to the drugstore and get a test, we really have to be able to have a way to, um, would it be more helpful? I think the governor's thinking it might be more helpful for our camera to focus on bigger. <laughs> the bigger screen. I, I would agree with this, and you can find all of this again on our website. But you know, one of, one of the main things with that is that it's really important um, 
to be able to say to everyone to be consistent across the state, you know, if, if one hospital is doing something different than another hospital, if one local health department is doing something different than another, how do all physicians and primary care providers know what to do? So what we do with our testing is, as we always have, hospitalized folks, the sickest people, we're prioritized, and that remains the same, and all healthcare workers, because we know keeping that healthcare system, that the thing that we all worked so hard on to avert together was to make sure that we can treat the sickest and not have our hospitals be overrun. So that remains the same in priority number one. In priority number two, we're looking, first of all, at Ohioans with symptoms, people who are actually sick at the time of presenting. And we've always looked more toward long-term care and congregate settings. Congregate settings are any place where more than six people are sort of living together. And of course, we know that makes you more at high risk because it's easier to spread infection. And this is often places where people can't always maintain effectively that six-foot distance and do all the social distancing that we talk about. Um, and that's a wide group of things from group homes to homeless shelters, youth detention centers to jails and prisons, veterans' home, nursing facilities we've talked a lot about. But as we move forward in workplaces, you know, you're also hearing about meatpacking facilities um, around the country. So, you know, any community place where there is an outbreak or a hot spot will be treated as sort of something that we have to look at you know, and prioritize. And that's what um, the, the part of priority two is. And that's important for two reasons. First of all, local health departments will play a major role in this. And, you know, public health, the state health department is a lot like the CDC. We do a lot of the research and data gathering. We bring best practices to the table, but everything real that happens in public health happens at the local level. It's really hand in hand with communities and hospitals and folks on the ground. Communities have to be able to make the best decisions for themselves. And so when we have an outbreak, perhaps um, like we've heard about in a meatpacking plant, it really is that business coming together alongside the local health department, alongside um, you know, a number of people in the community to solve a situation, and then they'll reach out to the state health department and we'll come alongside. In a nursing home that has an outbreak, similarly, you know, it'll be the local health department and epidemiologist with the medical director of that nursing home, and they'll try to problem solve, and if they need extra help, they'll reach out to us, we'll reach out to the CDC if we need more, and that's sort of how our health system works. So basically, priority two is all about getting those folks that are really high risk. And if, if there's an outbreak in a high risk place, not only are the employees and the folks there you know, more at risk, but the whole community becomes at risk because of course employees go home, they go home to their community, they go to the grocery store. And so as we move forward, we'll be prioritizing our testing as each situation uh, needs for those high risk folks. We also are going to always look out for our first responders. This means our you know, infrastructure workers, our critical workers, and this will be our first line EMS and our firefighters as well. Also, people that are higher at risk are 65 and older or those with pre-existing health conditions. And all of those will be in priority number two. Three is for our hospitals, as we move on and open up more and more of those procedures we've delayed and get back to our primary care, it's really important that hospitals have the ability to test folks coming in. They'll often do that testing for you if you're a patient coming for a procedure. You'll probably get that testing done up to three days in advance so they have time to get the results. Um, some procedures won't need it. If you're getting perhaps maybe a shot in your hip um, for some arthritis, we might not need to test you for COVID, but if you're getting a high-risk procedure like a bronchoscopy, we definitely want to test you. So those decisions will be guided, and each hospital will give patients that guidance. So what happens as we have more testing beyond these priorities? The most important thing there is that we'll be reaching out and looking more at people who are mildly ill in our community who aren't in those high-risk pre-existing health conditions. It would be, you know, your average healthy individual who might be having symptoms but doesn't need hospitalized. And that testing we really don't have enough for yet. Um, but certainly if your condition were to change, you would reach out to your provider. All testing still needs a, a, a provider 
to, to diagnose it and say you need it. So you can't do this without provider's order. Um, and eventually, even asymptomatic people will be tested. So that's sort of how we go from the highest priority to the lowest priority. Um, people are thrilled to have these criteria. It helps our whole state kind of work uh, tandem. So, so that's my um, sort of spiel, Governor. And all of this is on our website. And we'll certainly be glad to walk people through it as this moves forward. Um, next, I want to talk a little bit about some other data. Uh, this is our testing capacity. And, you know, we all were just on a phone call with governors from around the country, uh, with the vice president and the White House team. And we see that states all over feel that the month of May is going to be a big month of movement in the world of testing. And we certainly are pushing to be at the front end of that. Um, we have seen our daily testing go up from about three to 4,000 tests per day in Ohio to at the end of last week near six to a little over 6,000 tests per day. And we are going to be tracking that. We'll be tracking that um, for um, our state moving forward, and we'll also be providing that data. Um, we tend to do about 41 tests per 100,000 population. Our ultimate goal um, in an ideal world would be to be a little over 150 per 100,000 population. Cumulatively, we have tested about 1.3% of the Ohio population. Um, and as you know, Ohio was slower to get the test to begin with. We're catching up rapidly. We've made tremendous progress. We have a team fighting day and night. And you'll see, I'll be excited to share as well, the, as well the Lieutenant Governor, progress we make there. Um, finally, um, I think that's the end of our slides. Um, I really do want to say to folks, Moving forward, we did miraculous things together as a state. You know, we had to take sudden action. We headed off the disaster of our hospitals being overwhelmed. Um, we also did something important. We had time as a state, as your local health departments, as hospitals, to prepare for a disease no one knew. We know that every day we'll learn more and more about this disease, but we know enough now that we've been able to sort of set up the preparations to move forward. Our job moving forward will be to monitor these numbers, certainly look for outbreaks, do extensive contact tracing and testing around those outbreaks, and really try to decrease the spread of this disease. But as the governor said, we will be living with coronavirus for the foreseeable future. And so, so much more now will come to how we as individuals handle it. Again, coronavirus.ohio.gov, the best tips for you. It's where we began. It's where we are now. How can we as individuals protect ourselves and protect our families and also as individuals protect each other? So we will give you lots of tips there. Um, it really will be up to how we handle things and as communities and businesses handle things, but we have a lot more information. Don't forget that as a resource. And we'll be here every step of the way to try to give you the best information we have as we know it. Thank you. Dr. Atkin, thank you very much. We're ready for questions. Hi, Governor. It's Andrew Welsh Huggins with the Associated Press. Thank you for your comments about the media. We appreciate that. Um, Governor, I went to a big box store Saturday in Columbus where maybe one in 10 customers was wearing a mask. There were similar reports of uneven mask wearing at businesses around the state this past weekend. In addition, on Saturday night near Dayton, police from several departments dispersed a crowd of several hundred people who had gathered their cars together. and. In Akron on Sunday night, there was a gathering of dozens of people that unfortunately resulted in a shooting. My question is, uh, what are your concerns that your appeal last week that Ohioans have to stick together as the state reopens by wearing masks and continuing to practice social distancing is either being lost or frankly being ignored? And uh, what, if anything, can you do about it at this point? Well, first of all, it is in, in our hands. Uh, it's in the hands of my fellow citizens. Um, and in each individual decision that we make um, impacts that. And, you know, we've talked about this before, but this is the kind of the rare case or 
different case where what each individual does uh, is not just about protecting themselves or their family. It's about protecting people that they know, and many times it's about protecting people they have they don't know at all. Uh, you know, again, there, there's legitimate reasons uh, why someone might not couldn't physically uh, or for other reasons wear a facial covering uh, going into a um, retail store. But the fact remains that what you're doing when you do that um, is you're saying that you care about other people and that you want to protect them because you're not wearing that really to protect yourself. You're wearing that to protect other people. And so that message, uh, we're going to continue to do everything that we can to try to get across. Um, as far as gatherings of, of, of people, um, look, this is it's difficult. Uh, the police cannot be everywhere. The health department obviously cannot be everywhere. So a lot of this is falling on our shoulders as, as citizens in how we how we deal with this. Um, so this is a it's a, it's a work in progress. Uh, the numbers that we showed when I showed these numbers up here a little bit ago, um, those numbers um, we want to keep them going in the right direction. And uh, the numbers of the uh, hospitalizations that are trending downward have been for a few weeks. Uh, we got to keep them going in that direction. And we know that when you open up and you do more, naturally, you're going to see a spike in, 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 in cases. But we also know that we have it within our own power to control that to some extent and to dramatically cut those, those down. So I would just, again, appeal to every Ohioan. It's not about what you're being told to do. Uh, more and more of this is, is totally up to you. But it is, it is the right thing to do. Uh, and I think as summer is here or spring and feels like, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's the summer and uh, the natural inclination is to go out and want to do things. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we all want to do that. Fran and I go out and walk. And, and so, but people just, we need to remember that what we do impact, impacts others. So it, it's, uh, we're going to continue to talk about it and our ability to move fast, our ability to m get Ohio open. A and for my friends who think Ohio is moving too slow, I understand. Uh, we have other friends who think we're moving too fast. Uh, but to those who think that we're moving too slow, uh, you know, if you would look around, most of the states around us are behind Ohio. Uh, Indiana's probably a little bit ahead. Uh, but if you look at the other surrounding states surrounding us, most of them are behind where we're doing. So we're, take, we're taking a chance. We're taking a chance to, to move forward. Uh, we just need everyone to, to cooperate so we can continue to open up and continue to uh, get our economy moving again. Good afternoon, Governor. It's Laura Bischoff, Dayton Daily News. Uh, kind of piggybacking on Andrew's question, um, the stay safe uh, order allows you to go out and participate on, in things that are open, like um, you know, going to work if it's open, et cetera, going to a big box store, going grocery shopping. But it also says that you shouldn't be having any meetings of more than 10 people, um, and that you should really, your gatherings uh, should be limited to your own family household group. So my question is, when can we go to, um, you know, get away from Zoom book club meetings um, and go back to having, you know, small gatherings uh, amongst ourselves, having that backyard barbecue, that sort of thing? Laura, look, I mean, as a practical matter, people have done what they felt was right throughout this, and they've done what they wanted to do throughout this. I mean, this is not a case where, you know, the police come in and, and, and tell you you've got, uh, you know, you, you've got 11 people. Uh, I just don't think that's, that has ever been occurring. Uh, so ultimately, it's going to be up, up to the individuals uh, as, as we move forward. Um, the virus is just as much with us as it has ever been. And we do know that we have more vulnerable people among us 
people because of their age, people because of their medical condition. Um, but we also know that uh, what we do can impact other people. A 25-year-old, uh, you know, who wants to get together with their friends, you know, I fully understand all that. The only thing that that 25-year-old has to be thinking about is, you know, if they're not worried about getting it themselves, they, they have to also think about who they're going to come in contact when they go back home, who they're going to see over the weekend. Are they going to see their grandma? Are they going to see an aunt? Are they going to see somebody who maybe has some other medical conditions? So, so all of my, Laura, we're all on in this as individuals making our own individual decisions which then get translated into numbers that we see up up on the board and number of people who who end up with the with, with COVID-19. We're going to be living with this for a while unless some miracle occurs. Uh, we hope for the miracle. I'm an optimist. But, um, you know, we're trying to do two things at the same time, get the economy moving, but also stay safe. And it's going to come down to what you, you decide or what other people decide in their individual lives. Good afternoon, Governor. Randy Ludlow with the Columbus Dispatch. Um, as we reopen today, at least the general office environment, et cetera, there seem to be a lot of hesitancy from employers to abandon uh, work at home. It looks like they're gradually going to try to get back to the office. Uh, as we do that, you just outlined uh, an expanded testing program that to this point is ranked 46th per capita in the United States. Um, do you think what you have in place is enough to keep all hounds protected as you reopen retail next week? Hey, Randy, I think that, um, you know, talking about being 46, uh, we're not going to be 46 very long. Uh, I hadn't seen that figure, but, uh, you know, we are ramping up. Uh, it is a priority. We're going after it. Uh, we're focused on this because we know that this has to be done. We're going to have 1,800 people out there doing the tracing. Um, and so those numbers are dramatically going to change. Uh, and you're going to watch the chart, um, and I'm going to watch it too. And uh, we're going to see it's, it's going to go up. So, yeah, we, we feel good about where we are with testing, uh, with the potential of testing. We're not where we want to be today in the numbers. But we have the capacity now to do this, and we have the uh, supply chain in place, and we have Ohio manufacturers who are backing us. And, yeah, we're, we're, we're moving forward, and we're happy where we are, and uh, we're going to get it done. Governor, how many of the 1,800 contact tracers have been uh, hired? We're early on. Uh, I believe that uh, Dr. Acton uh, said the last survey we took, uh, there was about 680, but I may be off on that. Do you remember, Dr. Acton, where we are on that? I, I don't have those numbers with me, Governor, yeah. but I'll, I would like we'll, to address contact tracing later this week yeah, and yeah. give that well, to you. Randy, Randy we'll, we'll get those numbers for you. I mean, it, it is a work in progress. I mean, every health department has tracers. Uh, these are people who have done it before. Um, so this is not something new. What is new is the quantity that we're going to need uh, and the number of people that we're going to need. And, and we're looking at this for the long haul. Uh, you know, we want to hire, we would ideally hire people who will be able to be with us for a year or so uh, as we move forward on this. Thank you. Hello, this is Laura Hancock from cleveland.com. I have a question about the working groups. Um, we know that there are a lot of executives in the working groups of large hairstyle chains and restaurants, um, restaurant owners. Are there any lower level employees, the people who are going to be touching the general public um, and more exposed and more likely to transmit COVID on these groups? And also, will the proceedings be public? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. John may know the answer to that. Uh, look. We tried to be geographically diverse. Uh, we tried to be very diverse as far as the different sizes. Uh, and, and, you know, er every employer uh, has an incentive uh, to stay open, to protect their employees, to be able to attract employees. And w what is different today 
uh, and we've gone through different times and period. I'm, I'm sure different companies had a hard time attracting employees. But today we, what we have is if any company is not protecting their employees, they're not going to be able to get anybody to come to work. They're not going to be able to get anybody to stay at work. So there's a real incentive, I think, for uh, companies not only to do the right thing, and most of them do the right thing because it's the right thing, but if anybody is inclined not to do the right thing, the, the whole economic incentive is, is to try to run a restaurant or run a barbershop or whatever it is in a way that is as safe as humanly possible. John, do you have anything to yeah. add? Uh, th thank you, Governor. Uh, Laura, um, just to give you a little background about what the goal was here, it, when we've been doing the working groups, it's always been important that we have businesses that represents the diversity of that particular industry, geography, from a geography point of view, from a type of business point of view, a small restaurant, a chain restaurant, a fine dining, uh, a, a, a fast food. So we have all of those represented. Uh, we took appointments from the General Assembly for this group, from the majority and min minority caucuses uh, of, both, uh, of both bodies. Uh, and we also have health officials that are on this to make sure that the health folks are, are looking at the protocols to make sure that they make sense from a health perspective, and then the business folks who look at it to make sure that it's practical. And then those are in the process of being merged together um, presently uh, to make sure that that recommendation lands on the governor's desk for his review as soon as it, it can be put together. Uh, we can get you a list of the people that are on uh, here, that is not a problem at all. Uh, the press team should be able to get that to you uh, pretty easily. Uh, but that's the nature of, of what the goal of it was, was what the goal of the group was uh, and why it was assembled as it is. Okay, thanks. Kevin Landers, WBNS 10 TV. My question is for Dr. Acton. My question is, as businesses and restaurants open, let's just assume there are 50 people in one group, one area. One of those people is asymptomatic. How safe is it to go to work or to eat at that restaurant if you have a mask and you wash your hands? And as Governor mentioned, as we open up businesses, we will likely see a spike in cases. What is an acceptable spike? Thank you. Hi, Kevin. So I want to be completely um, help people remember what this virus is because I think it's been very easy as we think and we move forward to kind of forget some of the basics we've known from the beginning. You know, COVID-19 is highly infectious, um, and we as a population have not had it yet. Most of us have probably not had it yet. So there is no way around the fact that as we leave, as Laura was describing earlier, small groups of people, the numbers we have seen now up to this point are based on a large majority being home. We know people have been out and about more in the last two weeks. You know, we can tell that just by traffic data. But as we go more and more out, more and more of us will be exposed to this virus. It's essential that all of us do everything we can to protect ourselves and protect others. If we think that going out is going to look the way it looked six weeks ago, then we are not being completely honest with ourselves. We're not accepting the reality that there is a new virus. And I know there are folks who talk about the fact that, you know, how many deaths there are. But I, I think it's important for us to just be respectful of the virus and say this virus can make people very sick of all ages. And the sickness often is lasting three and four weeks before people recover. And the symptoms people have with it are things like extreme difficulty breathing. So I don't, I say this not to be a fear monger. I say this to be I'm not the virus, this is a virus, and I want to describe this virus to us. And what we know that keeps it from spreading is keeping as much social distance, six feet, washing our hands. Now we know that wearing a mask can help, 
not perfectly, but pretty good. It helps when I wear it to not give it to you. When we both wear it, there's a much less likely uh, chance that it will not be spread. So even if you were in a place, like say sitting in a restaurant and two people, the server was protected and the customer was protected, that really is helpful. But the question is, how much will we do those things? So I can't say enough. You know, every state is wrestling with how do we resume life, but how do we innovate and change? How do we as people accept what we can do? How do we as businesses do everything in our power, as businesses are trying to do, and some have done, you know, wonderful jobs. We can still eat. We can go to the grocery store because people set up new ways of doing it. That's what should be the conversation right now. There is no perfect way to go back to our old world. And we have to accept that we're living in a new world. And we have to accept that any one of us could be carrying it not knowing it. And every decision we make individually and every way we do our new work world has to take those realities. And I'm talking reality, big reality, not Dr. Acton reality, not, not any health department's reality. It's just the reality of this virus. And so I will say that every business that we are talking to and what we're trying to do is come up with the very best practices so that we can allow people the freedoms that we know they want so much but do it in a safe way. And it has to be a safe way. Businesses, most business owners, again, want to protect their workers. Most of my friends and family who own businesses want their business to succeed, but they want it to succeed and do well. The worst thing we can do, when we don't wear these masks or we pretend this virus is not here and this virus spreads rapidly and there are many, many outbreaks, people will panic. And they'll be afraid again. And we don't want to get to a place where we have to be afraid. That's not going to help us move forward. So every advice we're giving from our health department, from the CDC, from our employers, is to help people have the maximum freedoms of our lives back while keeping each other safe. So mm -hmm. folks, it, this is going to take, coming down the mountain is a lot harder than going up it. And this is a journey we're all taking together and I am asking you, every one of you, to learn what you can about this virus and do everything you can do. Use your judgment. Work with your community. Help those who can't be helped. Help those people who still it's not safe to go to the grocery store for. And we need to wear this to protect that worker who's there working on our behalf. And that, that's the right thing to do. Thank you. Hi, this is Jesse Balmer with the Cincinnati Inquirer. My question is for the governor. Uh, there's a proposal from lawmaker in Southwest Ohio to make the health orders recommendations and perhaps curb the ability for the Department of Health to make those. Would you veto any legislation that would restrict Department of Health's ability to address COVID-19? Are you open to more legislative oversight of that? I just have to see the language. I've not really looked at this language. Um, you know, certainly the, the legislature has every right to look at, uh, you know, any law that exists today. Uh, but um, we have to deal with this problem. Uh, and this is a huge, huge, huge problem. Uh, so I'll reserve uh, any uh, any comment until I actually see the legislation, but uh, it, you know we need to be able to deal with this problem. And you know, look, it, we we hope uh, that after putting these working groups together uh, and they come up with the best practices and people follow those best practices, and Ohioans uh, remember, as Dr. Acton says, that this virus is out there. Uh, you know, we we hope that. Uh, we don't uh, get to a situation where we fall back and have to issue additional regulations. I mean, this is really now, it's always been with the people of the state of Ohio. It's certainly now more than ever with the people of the state of Ohio. So we hope we would never, you know, have, have to uh, use those regulations. And I would just add one thing uh, that I think we sometimes miss. We put things, we put people in categories. Uh, and, you know, people get it and people will die. Um, there are people in between, and you know what we've seen is that people can get very, very, very sick. 
Um, I've seen it, um, and it's just, you know, it's not, some, this can go on for a month, longer than a month, uh, and has a real impact on people. Um, very, very, very tough for some people, and they never show up on the death because they don't die, but uh, it can be very, very tough. Thank you. Hello, Governor. Jim Province with the Toledo Blade. Coming from Toledo, we've been hearing a lot from people who live and, and recreate on Lake Erie. Um, your order does not specifically mention, as far as I can tell, marinas or boating. Um, Michigan has lifted its order as it applies to recreational boating. Can that occur if social distancing is practiced? Also, can shore vacation rentals proceed with bookings for this year? Turn to the uh, the Lake Erie fisherman. I, I I fancy myself a fisherman. John is probably more of a Lake Erie fisherman than than, than I am because I grew up in Southwest Southwest Ohio. Uh, but uh, you know, certainly people can go fishing, uh, and they can certainly go fishing on 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 Lake Erie. Um, but John, I'll turn it to you. Yeah, um, I can say that uh, marinas have been in the order. Uh, from the very beginning uh, as places that you can operate and then obviously all of the social distancing guidelines and the, and the recommendations on group size are then dictate everything after that so uh, there's never been a prohibition against marinas operating and people having access to their watercraft and, and so that has been allowed from from the very beginning uh, and in this particular uh, situation it's now everything else gets guided by the social distancing and, and CDC guidelines on group sizes, things like that. You know, I, I, Jim, I think as we look towards the summer, uh, more and more people up along Lake Erie and, and along the Ohio River and other, other places. I mean, I think what you, what, from a health point of view, what you just worry about is the g big gatherings of, of people. I mean, that's, that's, it comes down to the social distancing. It comes down to the gatherings of large number of people, um, you know. Most fishermen don't want to be around a lot of other fishermen, so that's not ever been a high uh, worry. But it's when you know you got a bunch of people who who are partying, and that's uh, we understand that. But that's where you get the the, the danger. Uh, that's where you get the, the you know the the real uh, challenge in regard to the spread. It's not that fisherman out fishing by herself or himself, you know, or even with a friend or two. You know. uh, in, in the way that I have seen the order, uh, we dealt with this with campgrounds and we dealt with this with the other, uh, other provisions uh, in the, the order. I will check to make sure on that. If you give me uh, the rest of this news conference, I will have an answer for you on that, Jim, just to make sure that yeah. I don't, that You're there's right. not something there that I'm missing. Adrian Robbins, NBC4, and my question's for Dr. Acton. Uh, the New York Times is reporting in an internal document, it showed that the U.S. would have a steady increase of cases and deaths, uh, doubling our daily deaths and four times the amount of new cases a day by June 1st. We haven't talked a lot about our curve, but does Ohio have projections of what this next month could look like for us, and is it possible that our numbers could mirror these numbers that the federal emergency management thinks that the U.S. will have. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and I'm sorry for, um, I appreciate your reporting and sorry that you had that situation. I, um, I, I do not have projections. I don't think there is um, a modeling that at this juncture um, can allow me to say and I'm not sure that anyone can fully say exactly what the future will hold. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things for people at home and all of us to live with is that it's not that this is an experiment, but the fact is we're in a place where this has never been done before. Um, we have never had the ability to protect against a surge the way we did, and we did that successfully. But as you're seeing, the very best scientists in the world are trying to figure out all over the world learning from each other. You know, sometimes we've had the 
blessing of seeing it hit other places first and watch what happens. But I think every scientist is going to be following the data closely now. Um, in real time, the good news is we have more data. There are things we never measured before, and now we have systems to measure it. But all of us are going to be watching as we, we go back into our lives and livelihoods and turn that dimmer switch up. We're going to have to watch these indicators and see what happens. Um, I do think um, we will see more. And I, I think it's hard for people to understand, even when we say deaths, we said something like, in a worse flu season in the United States, we have 60,000 deaths. Honestly, I think that's, we could do better than that. But that, that's been a very, very, very bad flu season. You know, we've seen that amount of deaths in our country um, in six weeks. Uh, we've seen, you know, more than, you know, 2,500 Americans die in a day. Um, and when you put that against other losses of life, you know, that's a hard thing to think about. And so I, I think we have to, again, be honest. This virus is going, it's a pandemic, a global pandemic. And um, we do know these numbers that we're going to see multiple peaks and crests. Our goal here in Ohio, and I'm sure everyone's is around the world, is to really try to manage the virus, really maximize how well we do in it, in a situation that no one has really experienced quite this way before. And that's what we'll do. That's what the governor is doing. That's what the lieutenant governor is doing. Is We're trying to put everything in place so that we can watch it and then with you, with all our partners, from hospitals to you know, mayors to county commissioners to all the local folks, really try to do, make the best steps as we move forward. And, and that's what we'll do. So I cannot predict the future, but I do know as we get about, we'll see more. We will definitely see more spread. For your support. Hi, Governor Jim Otte from WHIO-TV. As Ohioans go back to work, we've heard from a fair number of people who say they are skeptical that their employers are going to be able to satisfactorily meet all your guidelines to keep them safe. If, if they arrive back at the job, they need the money, they have to be there, but they just don't see the protections that you're asking for. What options do they have without putting their job at risk? Who do they call? Who do they talk to? Can that really be done to keep them safe? Well, it certainly can. They can call their local health department. We have 113 health departments in the state. They, they certainly can do that. I will tell you that um, when we were making the distinction between essential businesses and non-essential, people who continue to work, if people did not think that they were being, that they were safe, uh, they were calling. Uh, so, John, I don't know if you want to add add to that, but I mean, the, look, these, the rules are set down. They're easy to follow. They're easy to understand. And businesses, when they start back up, that's, you know, we are very, very concerned uh, about the employees. And employees have to feel comfortable uh, and that they've been in a safe position. We had a lot of, while I said there were some businesses uh, or some employees who didn't feel comfortable, um, I do know that, you know, a lot of businesses did a, a phenomenal job in the last uh, month or so in, in, in improving their safety to deal with the coronavirus. Yeah, thank, thanks, Governor. <coughs> and Jim, uh, fortunately, most of what it takes to keep yourself safe is, is really something that you are empowered to do. Uh, regularly washing your hands and... and uh, and creating the distance, the six-foot distance between you and another person, and wearing a mask. Those are or a face covering of some type. Those are things that you can do on your own to, um, to, to make sure that you personally are being protected. The employer has to go above and beyond that if you can't do those things. So they need to build a barrier. They also need to do the regular disinfecting uh, of, of the facility. If you do not feel uh, that it's being done appropriately, the first, because most, most cases, the employers want to do the right thing, but if you have a number of employees, maybe not every employee wants to cooperate with those standards. So first, let your HR department know or your supervisor that, that there's something in your, in your situation that's making you feel uncomfortable or unsafe, and hopefully they will address those. But you also can call the local health department, and the local health department will come out and, and inspect and enforce 
of the rules. That's that's the process that's always been. You don't have to give your name. Uh, you don't have to uh, tell them who you are or thre threaten your your employment. But the local health department is the enforcement entity on on these things. So there's a series of things that you can do. First, what you do per personally to keep yourself safe. What your employer can do uh, if not every employee is cooperating, uh, and then if the employer themselves is not is not seeing this through then your next option is your local health department. Hello everyone, Aron Hammy, WLIO in Lima. Governor, my question's for you. What sort of criteria has the state set that would force us to go backwards uh, into a stricter state home order after much of these businesses start opening? Uh, we've not set a specific place uh, that we will would do that. We certainly hope that we do not get to that point where we have to do that. Uh, we're going to, but we publish these numbers every single day. Uh, this is something that all, all Ohioans, if it occurs, uh, all Ohioans are going to be able to monitor uh, every every single day, and they're going to know what collectively. Um, is 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 happening. So, uh, as Dr. Acton likes to say, we're on a journey, and uh, you know we hope we never get to the point where where we have to turn back. That would not be what we want. Uh, I'm confident that Ohioans will be able to um, continue the social distancing, um, make the right decisions. That people who, you know, are particularly at risk will stay home. Uh, their own decision to do that limit their trips out uh, and just be very, very careful because there are, you know, are some among us who are certainly much more vulnerable uh, and need to be you know, extra, extra careful. Hi everyone, Andy Chow with Ohio Public Radio and Television State House News Bureau. I think this question is, is mostly for Dr. Acton. I wanted to talk about the idea of ramping up testing and these new protocols, are you expecting, I'm sure you are, expecting to see an increase in confirmed case numbers? How do you as a state sort of gauge those numbers against increases that we've seen before? What's your message to the public who might start logging in and seeing these case numbers go up, but that might be, be more likely because of ramped up testing and not because the virus is spreading? That's right, and so that is a really great question. You know, we've known that we've not been able to test all the cases that are out there, and we will even learn about deaths that we haven't known that were out there in retrospect. So it's really important to try as best you can to compare apples to apples. And if you just look at case numbers going up, and I said cases went up by 1,000 today, but I did 100,000 more tests that might be the reason the numbers went up. I just, I'm testing a lot more. So there are some other numbers. I think it's really important because we are being compared and you know we're looking at how many cases a state has as a raw number, so we'll always share that. But other numbers can be very important. One of them is something called the positivity rate, um, which is the amount of positive tests over like sort of all the tests you have done um, and all the negatives you have done. So those sorts of numbers um, allow for it to take out the fact of how much tests you're doing, but keeping the, the ratio the same. So positivity rate in Ohio right now is at about 11%, and we're going to be adding more graphs where people can actually watch positivity rate change. Another great measure that states, and I say this, where the reasons we didn't like start three months ago with these measures is nobody had known the virus or knew what measures yet, but across states we're all starting to say, and the CDC is saying, um, Co that um, COVID-like illnesses. So we have a surveillance system that exists in emergency rooms. So anyone who presents with symptoms that look like uh, COVID-19 and is seen in an ED is a really good indicator of how much, because it takes usually you know, a lot longer for us to find out about something, but you can actually see ED visits almost on a daily basis. So that's a very earlier sort of indication of which direction we're going versus waiting for someone to need to be in the ICU or need to have died to count you. And so we're going to look at things like that. Um, we're going to be looking at all sorts of testing numbers, um, data on contact tracing, just to see how our processes are working. But um, 
the, the, the overall essence of this, we'll also look at R0, which is how much one person infects another person. We know in the beginning of this disease, it could be three to four to five people in some of the early studies. Right now in Ohio, by when we were staying more at home, we really got that number down to just hovering about one person and giving it to one person. And so we're gonna watch that number over time. So we'll really look at a number of indices, no one thing. We'll also hopefully look at some economic indicators as well, because all of that is really interesting information, especially for policymakers who have to make really hard decisions. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. Karen Johnson, WLWT Cincinnati. We're hearing from a lot of 1099 employees who are falling through the unemployment cracks, say they're unable to get help from the state. It's been since March. Many are dipping into their savings, if they have any. Many of these are hairstylists, gym owners. What's being done to help them? And can you give them any specific dates of when they can go back to work, or even just the time frame, another week, two weeks, a month? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off and then I'll flip it over to John. Uh, we have working groups um, that should be reporting the next few days in regard to all those. We understand um, that many times they're sole proprietors, many times that they just have several employees. These are small businessmen and women who have really been hurting. We know that they don't make any money if they're not working. Uh, so we, we understand that. Uh, what they present is, is a, obviously a challenge in the sense that they're working very, very closely uh, with, with people. But, but I got a report yesterday or this morning, I guess, uh, in, in regard to some of these working groups. Uh, we'll have some information in the next, in the next few days on, on where we're headed. So we want to get them back to work, but we also want to do it in, obviously in, in a safe way. Sean. Uh, yes, thanks, Governor. I'll try to go through this quickly. Right now, uh, if you're 1099, you can apply for uh, the benefits that you would get under the CARES Act. Uh, the CARES Act did provide for unemployment services and, uh, for those individuals. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a system for that, so we have to build a brand new one. So now we're at the point you can apply. People have been doing that for a little over a week. Uh, we expect that sometime around mid-May, uh, those, those, those will be processed and people will begin receiving money from them. Uh, but it, we are at a position in Ohio that we had to build a new system. Uh, it, it's not going uh, as fast, certainly, as, as uh, I know the need has been created. But they will be, those benefits will be backdated to the individual from the, from the first date they were eligible. And so, you know, that's the quick, that's the quick summary of it. Um, they can apply now. The benefits will be backdated. They should start getting processed around mid-May. Hello, Governor. This question is for the Lieutenant Governor. Um, sir, uh, the primaries were less than a week ago. In the return ballots, um, I don't know if they were positive. Is that what you expected? What's your take on the on the process for the future? Well, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn that o over ultimately to the current Secretary of State, Frank LaRose. I, I know that uh, Frank and I talk though frequently, and he is you know, thinking about what the process should look like. Look, I, I would say that the mail-in ballot process for the primary worked as well as you could, you could expect something to do that you were really creating on the run. Uh, and, and for the most part, that, that system worked. Fortunately, in Ohio, we have a system that provides an all of the, all of the above uh, opportunity for voters. We have mail-in ballots where everybody this November will be sent an absentee ballot request in the mail. They will be able to fill it out and send it in and vote without ever leaving their home. So that is already baked into Ohio's system, and that it will be there and that works, and, and so nobody will have to physically go anywhere to vote in Ohio this year. But we've also had traditionally in-person early voting at the local Board of Elections, and then our precinct-based system on the election day. 
I think, you know, it's, as the governor has said, it's premature to begin to decide what November is going to look like, but it's not premature for any of us to think about it. You're, so your question is on mark. Uh, we all need to think about it. I know that the Secretary of State uh, has some ideas uh, that he's put together on this. And so uh, I'm sure in the in the coming uh, weeks and months that as we see the progression of the virus and how well we do, that that will dictate some of, of the decisions regarding the election. I did introduce myself. This, uh, this was Luis Gale with uh, Ohio Latino TV. Thank you so much. Sad to hear uh, that Ohio football legend Don Shula has died. Born in Lake County, graduate of John Carroll University. He served our state and country as a member of the Ohio National Guard. Uh, he played seven seasons in the NFL, two with the Cleveland Browns. He earned a spot in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, the only coach to lead his team to an undefeated season in the Super Bowl era. Uh, Fran, I extend our sincerest condolences to his wife, Mary, and uh, their children, Dave, Donna, Sharon, uh, and Mike. I want to close with a video that Jeremy Guy, Assistant Commissioner of the Mid-American Conference, or the MAC for short, recently sent us. Many of our fine universities uh, in Ohio are part of the MAC, uh, University of Akron, Bowling Green, Kent State, Miami, Ohio University, and University of Toledo. Uh, this video reminds us of what we can look forward to uh, by practicing social distancing, uh, what the future will, will bring. Eric? See you all tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Thank you.